Good afternoon and welcome to Fix Security's introduction to fixed income webinar. Uh, my name is Gavin Madsen, I'm the Director of Research here at Fix Securities and I'm joined today by with David Moore, uh, who's the National Head of Fixed Income Sales. Um, before we start, I'd just like to highlight down the right hand side, as was highlighted in that previous slide, uh, you can ask questions at any time throughout the presentation. Uh, because of the number of people we've got attending today, we won't get, might be able to get to all of them during the presentation, but uh, we will endeavour to answer them after we've uh, finished today and, and get back to you with, uh, with answers. Um, but I will ask someone as we, as, our, as we make our way through the presentation. Uh, and um, and as, as I said, uh, the others will be answered at the end and just to let you all know this will be recorded and it will be up on our website the next day or two. Uh, I'll now turn you over to David Moore. Okay, thanks very much Gavin uh, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us here today. Uh, the webinar will take about an hour and uh, we welcome all your, your questions and we'll, we'll try to deal with as many of those as we can as we go through. Now, just to kick off, um, a little bit about FIG Securities. Uh, FIG was established in 1998, so the company's been around for about 15 years now and FIG's Australia's largest fixed income broking firm. Uh, we have offices in uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne and Perth, with Brisbane being head office. Uh, and what FIG is all about is providing direct access to fixed income markets for all, all investors in Australia. Uh, the company has over $9 billion in funds under administration, uh, including $8 billion in um, our Turn Deposit brokerage service. And what the Turn Deposit business involves essentially is providing access to over 60 approved deposit taking institutions. So that's the banks, building societies and credit unions, all of which are regulated by APRA and are subject to the government guarantee on term deposits up to and including $250,000. Um, so on any given day, our clients can uh, access rates from those 60 institutions and uh, determine who's offering the best rates for any given term. The, uh, that term deposit business represents about 20% of FIG's overall business uh, and the rest of it is, the other 80% is essentially uh, providing access to the bond market. Um, but FIG's entire business is about providing direct access to fixed income investments. An important part of FIG's business is also providing dedicated fixed income research and I'm sure uh, most, of you, most of you on the call would appreciate that good investing always gets back to good research uh, and our research team is, is very much dedicated to preserving the wealth of our clients uh, and providing them access to the best relative value opportunities across the spectrum of fixed income assets in Australia. So fixed income, what is it? Uh, in a nutshell, fixed income investments covers all those assets that pay interest. Uh, so that includes at-call accounts, term deposits, bank bills and negotiable certificates of deposit, bonds uh, including government bonds and corporate bonds and hybrid securities. So it covers a lot of ground um, and the focus of, for this presentation is very much going to be on bonds uh, because most people understand and appreciate what an at-call account is. It's essentially just a term, term deposit maturing uh, every day. Uh, term deposits, again, people are very familiar with those. Um, you're literally lending the bank money for a designated term with the promise of the bank repaying principal and interest at maturity. Then bonds. Um, uh, uh, bonds uh, similar to term deposits in the sense that they're simply a loan. So you're, you're lending the issue of money uh, with the promise of repayment at maturity and periodic interest along the way. Hybrid securities, as the name implies, a hybrid is a mix of a bond and shares. Um, so a bond and equity, they have both bond and equity like characteristics. Um, and uh, as we say in the presentation, it's uh, very important that you, uh, whenever you invest in a hybrid, that you read the terms and conditions in the prospectus because no two hybrids are alike and we'll, we'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Now, just a little bit, just for your interest, uh, a few facts on the, um, uh, on, the, on the market that we, that we operate in. There's about 500,000 self-managed super funds in Australia, so what that means is there's a 
ever increasing pool of investors looking to take control of their own investments. Um, the funds in self owned super funds account for about half half a billion dollars, uh, and the average balance in a self managed super fund is just shy of one million dollars. So it's a big pool of capital. And self managed super fund investors, uh, many many of which are retirees, um, are increasingly looking for a greater defensive allocation in their portfolio. So that means allocating to low risk assets such as term deposits and bonds. And hence why FIG is um, providing a lot of education to the market now about um, about what bonds are and, and FIG's made bonds accessible to investors like you and I. So going further into what is a bond and comparing them to equity. A bond is simply an IOU. It's a promise of repayment. Uh, it's a, it's a loan uh, with the promise of repayment. So if you're investing in, in a bond, you're acting like a banker. You're, you're lending money out with the promise of repayment with, print, print, uh, with interest paid along the way periodically. Repayment is guaranteed by the issuer of the bond, by the borrower. Um, now, obviously there is a possibility of, a, of the borrower actually um, going into receivership and, and liquidation, but one of the interesting things about the Australian bond market is it's it's really very much an investment grade bond market, which is it, it's it's mainly the, the the banks, the insurance companies, and very large companies who have access to the bond market. So um, almost by definition, if you're investing in a bond in Australia, it's it's with a very high quality borrower, uh, and the, the, the probability of, a, of one of those entities going to wind up is is very very low. So comparing bonds to equity, uh, equity is simply uh, an ownership stake in a company. So you, uh, you are the owner of the company and as the owner you're entitled to uh, any residual value that, that that company can generate after all its other commitments are, are made. So you, you own the shares in expectation of a growing share price and growing dividends over time. But it's important to understand that there's no guarantee of, the dividend, of, of any dividend being paid or return of capital. Unlike a bond, which has a maturity date, uh, shares do not have a maturity date. And that's one of the reasons why owning shares is inherently riskier and more volatile than owning bonds. The other reason, of course, is that, that guaranteed um, income payment. Shares pay dividends. The dividends are discretionary. Um, they're paid at the, disc uh, at the discretion of the directors of the company, um, subject to the company making a profit. Unlike with bonds, where the company is legally obliged to pay the interest to investors, and if they don't, that's considered a default, and the bond investors can literally seize the company and um, and recover what what value is left in it. So, just moving along to the next slide, a few facts on the bond market. Now, Australian investors really haven't been that exposed to bonds historically. Um, and the reason for that is bonds have been traded in minimum denominations of five hundred thousand dollars, which meant it's been uh, the, the domain of the the banks and the institutions. Uh, private investors uh, have only recently gained access to the bond market um, through FIG by being able to invest in bonds down to sizes of fifty thousand dollars. So for many private investors. Um, it's now possible to build a diversified bond portfolio uh, and, and increase the defensive allocation in your portfolio without giving up so much yield. So a couple of facts. The global bond market is approximately five times the size of global equity markets. So we're talking about a very old, very large market. Uh, and um, bond markets tend to be very deep and very active. The vast majority of bonds are traded over the counter or in the OTC market as it's known. So this differs from shares which trade on an exchange or on the ASX. Now over the counter just means that it's a negotiated market, uh, not unlike the, the foreign exchange market where you go to a bank or a broker uh, to buy foreign exchange. So same with bonds. Um, uh, so just because it doesn't trade on an exchange doesn't mean it's, it's not a very large and active market because uh, it is. Now the biggest issues of bonds are sovereigns or governments and financial institutions, so the banks and the insurance companies. In terms of size, the Australian dollar bond market is worth approximately $1 trillion, um, of which 
Australian government bonds account for about a quarter of that and semi-government bonds um, about another quarter. So there's a lot of government bonds on issue, uh, but there's also a lot of corporate bonds on issue and this is where investors uh, get much better yields, some, some very attractive yields. Bonds can be sold prior to maturity um, and are generally very liquid. So unlike a term deposit, which is, isn't a traded uh, instrument, uh, bonds can be sold at any time and because bonds tend to be issued in very large sizes and are traded actively by the banks and the funds and, and companies such as FIG, then uh, it's generally very easy to sell your bond at any time and realise fair value for it. Like any instrument that's traded, there's an opportunity for capital gain or loss. Uh, that's just simply because prices move. But it, we need to be aware that bond prices tend to be fairly static. Uh, they, they tend to move at glacial pace um, and tend not to deviate too much from the issue price um, or the you know or, or what's expected back at maturity. Uh, but certainly um, through dedicated research and, and not anomalies in the market, there, there certainly are opportunities to pick up some um, some very good value assets and that's part of what the research team is, is dedicated towards doing for its clients. Now global best practice suggests that superannuation portfolios should contain between 40 and 50 percent of bonds and increasing over time. Now um, the rule of thumb is that you should own your age in bonds. So that means if you're 60 years old, 60 percent of your portfolio should be in bonds. And the simple reason for that is that once you've retired, uh, you can't replenish your capital by working. Okay, your your um, your income, the sole source of your income is your investment portfolio. So uh, it um, it can be quite painful to actually suffer any kind of capital losses. Now, the Australian, Australian investors are, are really overly exposed to so-called risk assets being shares and property. Uh, and this is one reason why uh, Australian investors generally suffered disproportionately during the GFC around five years ago. Uh, and given only uh, or less than 1% of self-funded super fund money is in bonds currently, um, we you know, will suffer the same fate uh, if there's another market uh, dislocation. So. It, it makes perfect sense as we get older to allocate more of our capital to assets that are expected to hold their value and pay a, a reliable rate of return. Now, there's lots of different types of bonds out there um, and bonds paying different types of returns. Uh, so in a nutshell, you can own a fixed rate bond, a floating rate bond or an inflation linked bond. A fixed rate bond pays a fixed return for the life of the bond and is set at the time of the issue. Now there's a bit of jargon in the fixed income market like there are in most industries and one of those, um, one word you might come across is coupons. Coupon is just another word for interest. So deposits pay interest, bonds pay coupons. It's just another word for interest. Now with a fixed rate bond, an example there might be Telstra issues a bond today uh, worth $100. Uh, with the promise of repaying in five years' time at $100 and it pays an interest rate of 6%. Now, due to market convention, fixed rate bonds typically pay interest twice a year or semi-annually. So if it's paying, uh, it's issued at $100 and it's paying a 6% rate of return, uh, the investor can expect to receive $3 every six months in interest and $100 back in maturity. If you hold to maturity, if you buy at issue and hold to maturity, then you'll uh, you're guaranteed by Telstra to earn 6% per annum rate of return. But like all bonds, the bond trades and the price can go up and down. So you'd expect the price um, on, a, on a fixed rate bond, if, if there's a lot of demand for Telstra bonds and, and if interest rates generally fall, uh, the price of that bond can be expected to rise and vice versa. Uh, a floating rate bond, so it's, there is a, a misconception in the market and it's perpetuated often by the media that um, if interest rates rise, bond prices fall. Now that can be true of fixed rate bonds and often the media is simply referring to fixed rate government bonds, but it's also possible to benefit from interest rates rising by owning a floating rate bond. And in that case, uh, a floating rate bond pays a fixed margin over and above a floating rate benchmark. 
So let me explain that. The floating rate benchmark is something called the bank bill swap rate, also known as BBSW. And BBSW is set daily uh, in the wholesale market by banks and it just simply reflects where short term wholesale interest rates are. A floating rate bond will pay a fixed margin over and above at this rate. And by market convention, floating rate bonds typically pay interest every three months. Not always, but mostly. So for example, if Telstra issues a bond today at $100, um, it might be paying a interest rate or a coupon of the three month bank bill rate plus 2%. Um, the three month bank bill rate is currently 3%. So for that first quarter, well, the first three months, the investor will earn a 5% rate of return. And in three months time, we look at what the bank bill rate is on that day, um, apply the 2% margin on top, uh, and that's what the investor will receive for the next quarter and so on and so forth uh, until the final interest payment in five years time and $100 is returned. So that's how it works. Now we've also got... Uh, Dave, I've just got a question here from Carol. Uh, when, the fix, when the floating rate bonds go up and down with bank bill swap rate, is that like uh, the cash rate that the RBA announces every month? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. So um, the bank bill swap rate or BBSW generally does reflect um, the Reserve Bank cash rate. So the, the cash rate set by the RBA at the moment is 3%. Uh, and, and BBSW, which is actually set for one month out to six months, uh, is also around 3%. Traditionally, um, just out of interest, the, uh, the three-month bank bill rate, which most floating rate notes are set off, uh, trades about 15 basis points higher than the cash rate set by the Reserve Bank. So um, in a normal market, if the cash rates are 3%, then BBSW would be at 3.15%. So yeah, good question. So the, the third type of bond, um, providing a different kind of return again, is an inflation-linked bond. And, and FIG is actually seeing a lot of demand for inflation-linked bonds currently, and with good reason. Um, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about uh, inflation rising. Uh, and quite simply, a lot of investors uh, really can't afford uh, to be wiped out by inflation, especially when they're not working and have no other way to protect themselves from it. So an inflation only bond pays interest every three months uh, and the returns are tied to what's known as the, the con Consumer Price Index, or CPI, which is the measure of inflation. And it's measured by the Australian Bureau of Stat Statistics. And the CPI just reflects uh, general changes in the cost of living. So the best and most pure way for any investor to protect themselves from inflation is to own an inflation linked bond. Now there's two main types of linkers as they're known. One is a capital index bond and the other is an indexed annuity bond. And I'll just briefly explain how they work. So a capital index bond, and a good example of one is, is one issued by Sydney Airport. You get both a rising capital base and a rising income stream over time. As long as CPI is positive, um, as long as we have positive inflation, uh, which is the norm, then the value of your bond increases, or what's known as the index face value goes up, and the fixed rate of interest paid on that rising capital value also rises. So rising capital value and rising income stream, um, both moving in line with the general cost of living. So that provides, apart from the fact that it's issued by Sydney Airport, which is a, a, a large monopoly business uh, with a lot of pricing power and inherently very low risk, the fact that they've issued a bond that protects you from inflation makes it uh, even more low risk. Okay, because inflation uh, is, yeah, every every investor is exposed to inflation, and uh, it, it's a it's a it's a key risk that we all face. So the other type of inflation linked bond is what's known as a as an inflation indexed annuity. Now many of you would have heard of the annuity uh, annuities issued by Challenger. Annuity bonds uh, have similar characteristics in the sense that they pay a designated payment every quarter comprising both principal and interest, and that, that fixed payment amount is indexed to inflation. So if the payment amount is $1,000 this quarter, 
next quarter it'll be a thousand dollars plus the inflation rate. So it's going to be a little bit more. So you, again, you expect a rising stream of payments over time, which protect you against increases in living costs. So essentially, in terms of the characteristics of fixed income as an asset class, um, there are four key things here. Um, we have capital stability, and that just simply means that bonds are renowned for holding their value and not deviating from their uh, from their issue price or their maturity value by too much. So it provides a good anchor to any portfolio. It also provides excellent cash flow. Um, now I'll just go back a step. There's there's essentially three main asset classes. You've got property, which pays rent. You've got shares, which pay dividends. You've got fixed income, which pays interest. Uh, and, and obviously the focus of this presentation is fixed income. Now, clearly there's risk to the tenants not paying rent or to a property being vacant. Uh, you're exposed with shares from the company not making a profit or the directors not paying a dividend or, or reducing the size of that dividend to preserve cash. And as I've already touched on, with fixed income, it's a guaranteed interest payment by the, by the borrower, by whoever you're lending to. So the cash flow is very reliable and the bulk of your returns comes from that interest payment. So with those three asset classes I mentioned, your return comes from two sources, income and capital gain or loss as the case may be. And fixed income is characterised by most and sometimes all of the return coming from interest and, uh, and not a lot of deviation in price, uh, unlike property and shares where you've got a lot more uncertainty around your income uh, and also a lot more volatility in the price of property and shares. So we've covered capital stability and cash flow. Fixed income also offers liquidity. As I've mentioned, bonds trade in very deep, very active markets. Um, there's over 300 bonds that FIG trades actively, and the universe of bonds is, is broader than that, that, that our investors have access to. And they, you know, most of these bonds trade every day in, in large size. So that just means that if our investors are looking to realise fair value, uh, generally there, there's no problem doing that. They just uh, place an order to, to sell their asset um, and that's sold and market convention is to uh, settle that in three business days, just as is in the share market. Uh, if, you, if you transact today, um, if you buy something, you pay for it in three business days. If you sell something, you get paid in three business days. Same in the bond market, but because the bond market trades over the counter in, an, in a negotiated market, if you want to settle in 10 days or if you want to settle tomorrow, you can request that and generally we can facilitate it. Fixed income also offers diversity. Um, I've mentioned the opportunity to diversify by interest rate by receiving fixed, floating or inflation linked returns. But there's also a whole range of issuers from a whole range of different sectors uh, that our investors can get exposure to. So banks, insurance companies, uh, large infrastructure companies, uh, industrial companies such as Telstra and Woolworths, um, there's plenty of ways to get diversity by issuer and also by interest rate. Now, I'd really like everyone to uh, focus on this slide because it's possibly the most important slide in the presentation uh, and I'd, I'd really like everyone to get a, a solid understanding of it. Now I'd say that there are three things that investors really care about and they are risk, return and liquidity. Return, most people get. Okay? People understand the difference between earning 5% and 10%. Liquidity, uh, people have learnt about, particularly over the last five years since the GFC, since liquidity all but dried up. Uh, and liquidity is just the ability to access your funds at short notice. Uh, we, we saw a lot of funds um, freeze during the GFC and some are still frozen um, and quite simply investors money was locked up. Um, one of the beauties of fixed income is that you own the bonds directly and have full control at all time. You're not exposed to what other investors are doing as you are when you own your assets via a fund. Anyway, I'm getting off track. I've spoken about return, I've spoken about liquidity. Risk is the one thing that investors seem to have a relatively poor understanding of and something that figures intent on educating the market on 
so they go in and so investors are getting well compensated for the risk that they're bearing. And this chart goes a long way to explaining uh, how you go about understanding risk. It's a capital structure and a capital structure explains how any entity funds itself. Be it a government, a bank or a company, um, you need money or capital to run and if in a worst case scenario, who gets paid first? And, and this is exactly what the capital structure des describes. It's a pecking order of risk. So, without looking at the layers yet, if, if a company goes into wind up, right, if it's in liquidation, then the people at the top of the pecking order get paid first and those at the bottom get paid last if there's anything less, if there's anything left. So the assets are sold by the liquidator, um, funds go to the senior secured debt investors, then the term deposit investors, then the senior debt investors and so on and so forth down the chain. Uh, another way of looking at it is uh, losses applied are applied from the bottom up. Uh, the shareholders are wiped out first, then the hybrid investors, then the subordinated debt investors and so on and so forth up the chain. So this, as I said, every company and every bank has a capital structure. Uh, this is a capital structure of a what we call a simplified bank. Um, banks, in, in actual fact, have more layers than this and, and more complex capital structures. But this goes a long way to explaining how it actually works. So a bank issues senior secured bonds. Now, senior because it ranks at the top of the capital structure. It has first priority uh, in the event of a wind up. Secured because the investors have security over actual assets. Uh, and banks have issued covered bonds um, and they're covered or secured by a pool of mortgages. And generally speaking, for every $100 in covered bonds that the banks issue, investors have security over 120% of mortgages, uh, real assets. So not only do you have the bank promising to repay you at maturity and pay you interest along the way, if they don't uh, and the bank fails, then the liquidators sell the assets and the senior secured bondholders get paid out first. So that's how it works in reality. Next in line are term deposit investors. Now, whenever governments intervene in markets, uh, uh, often it gives rise to anomalies and that's the case with term deposits at the moment because the Australian government has actually guaranteed term deposits with all Australian APRA regulated approved deposit taking institutions up to $250,000 with every institution. So clearly th this is a risk free investment and ranks ahead of senior skilled bondholders uh, in the pecking order uh, for that first $250,000. Um, if you invest a million dollars, well the first 250,000 is guaranteed, the next $750,000 is an unsecured loan, but still very safe, but ranking behind the covered bond investors. Uh, banks also issue senior bonds, let's assume this is Commonwealth Bank, uh, they, they, they might issue a, a five year senior bond known as a, with a bullet maturity, which means that you're going to get all your money back at maturity, every $100 that the investor paid uh, on issue. Uh, with interest along the way. Uh, and it's, it's, it's known as a senior bond because it ranks ahead of all other bonds in the capital structure. Subordinated bonds are a little bit riskier, not a lot, uh, but a typical structure for a subordinated bond is called, it's a 10 non-call 5, which means uh, the bank can repay investors after five years and if they don't, oftentimes they will pay a higher rate of interest and it matures in 10 years time. Uh, there's actually been no cases of an Australian bank not paying investors um, on that call date. So uh, subordinated bonds tend to be very low risk as well. Then we get down to hybrids and you have debt like hybrids and equity like hybrids. Um, most, a lot of people on the call no doubt are very familiar with hybrids uh, because uh, investors like you and I haven't had good access to bonds traditionally going back a long time, we've got our fixed income exposure from term deposits and ASX listed hybrids. Now a lot of those ASX listed hybrids haven't performed very well. Um, a, a, couple of the, a couple of those that have performed particularly badly, guns, elders, paper links, but we've also seen some of the high quality issuers uh, 
fall in price significantly as well, uh, including those issued from some of the banks. Now, something to be aware of is that since the GFC, the regulators are expecting more investors in the capital structure to bear equity type risk, and this includes the hybrid investors. So hybrids have become much more equity-like and less debt-like, uh, and that's not good for investors because it means that the hybrids have become riskier. Um, still, you, you don't have blue sky on your investors, like you, on your hybrid on, on your hybrid investments, like you do with shares. Uh, you've got a capped return, but you have um, equity-like risk. So you really need to be aware and understand the terms before investing in those hybrids. Um, yeah, investing in subordinated bonds, senior bonds, term deposits, and senior secured covered bonds gives you um, a much lower risk profile as an investor. And then sitting under hybrids, of course, is is the shareholders. Um, so, um, you know, shareholders are investing for increasing dividends and uh, and high share prices over time. Uh, you really want to see a company perform. And I'm a big believer that there's there's good opportunities in any asset class, at any point in time. Uh, same with the share market, but it's inherently riskier. So if you're looking at that defensive part of your portfolio, uh, you'd be you'd be looking away from equities. Any questions? So, in terms of how that translates into the market, um, I think a picture tells a thousand words, and this here is a chart of three securities issued by the Commonwealth Bank and how they've performed over the last five years. You've got uh, CBA shares, uh, the Pearls hybrids, the Pearls 3 hybrid, uh, and uh, senior bonds issued by CBA. Now the blue line represents the bonds and as you can see from $100 back in January 08, there's a slow and steady accretion of value um, over time and that's exactly as you'd expect. You collect your interest payment and the bond holds its value. Um, there's a little bit of movement in the price but not a lot. The green line it represents the hybrid or the, the pearls. A uh, bit more volatility there, again, as you, as you would expect, um, and with the shares, more volatility again. Now you can actually see the, the hybrid investment actually lost about 35% of its value um, around March 09 at the depths of the GFC, and um, shareholders actually lost more than 50% of value. Now I think that's really interesting with CBA. We, we'd regard CBA as uh, the bluest of blue chip companies on the ASX. But even this company, at one point, uh, shed over half of its value, um, and, w and and also cut its dividends. So for those investors relying on income, um, uh, and also those who aren't working and can't recoup capital losses, that's a pretty that's a pretty scary time, um, and uh, they're experiencing similar, if not magnified, losses elsewhere on their portfolios. So in in summary, this chart demonstrates two things. Uh, firstly. Uh, the, the compound returns on the senior bond over the last five years has actually outperformed uh, both the shares and the hybrids. But more importantly, because that's not always going to be the case, more importantly, the bonds have been very stable, the hybrids a bit more volatile, and the shares very volatile. Uh, and you'd expect that to be the case always. This is generally how securities behave, and, and, and this is a good illustration of, how, of, of different securities in the same capital structure and how they behave in price terms. All right, so continuing on from the uh, capital structure diagram, I really want to focus on what are the main risks um, of investing in bonds. First, you've got credit risk, and that's, that's just simply the risk of not getting your money back. Uh, and it's the, the principal risk that our team of analysts look into. A credit analyst is very focused on the company's balance sheet. So they care, is the issuer going to survive and meet its obligations? Uh, as opposed to an equity analyst who tends to be more focused on the profit and loss statement and the potential for the company to seize opportunities and grow earnings. Uh, as fixed income analysts, we care more about um, the worst case scenario, the downside, okay? because we, we, we don't want to lose a dollar uh, on our fixed income investments. Now another risk is the ability uh, not to be able to sell uh, an asset at short notice. And as I've mentioned, 
Um, most bonds uh, tend to be very liquid, uh, and most of our clients would would testify to that. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest all of our clients would. Uh, very rarely would we have any trouble uh, selling a bond in a reasonable time frame to satisfy our clients. Uh, compare that to the share market, and I'd suggest that the top hundred largest companies on the ASX tend to be uh, very liquid or quite liquid. But beyond that, uh, for the other 1,200 odd companies, uh, liquidity tends to be quite poor. Uh, and that's reflected through a, a wide bid offer spread, so the transaction costs tend to be quite high. Uh, and the ability to sell at short notice at a fair price uh, tends not to be great. Uh, property market, similarly. Uh, I'd say liquidity is probably coming back a little bit into the property market, but it, it takes some time to, to sell your property. And um, it, it doesn't sell like hotcakes as, as, as they do in the bond market. Now, another main risk investors face is inflation, which is the risk of uh, the price of goods and services accelerating and devaluing your purchasing power. So, um, the beauty of an inflation linked bond is investors are able to lock in a, a real rate of return over and above inflation. So, you don't just cover yourself for inflation, you get a return over and above that. Um, Fig's actually written a lot of articles on inflation, and uh, particularly in the last month or so. And uh, one of the articles that Dr. Stephen Nash produced um, showed a good uh, illustration of how different asset classes protect investors against inflation. And in summary, it actually showed that shares provide quite a poor protection. In fact, the correlation is marginally negative uh, between inflation. Um, and uh, yeah, between inflation and in uh, in property uh, again, the correlation is is quite poor. Now another risk is in interest rates. So particularly with a fixed rate bond, the risk of rates going higher. Um, and on a fixed rate bond, if the rate goes higher, the price goes lower. So it's not the risk of not getting your money back at maturity. It's just the risk of uh, the bond price moving adversely uh, during the holding period. Floating rate notes uh, tend not to be that exposed to outright moves in interest rates. They tend to be more influenced by uh, the term remaining to maturity uh, and the credit margin, what's known as the, the credit margin, reflecting the credit risk on the issue of the bond. Now another risk is core risk, and I touched on this earlier, it's the risk that a subordinated bond or hybrid security is not repaid at the first opportunity. Very rare that a subordinated bond is not repaid at the first opportunity, um, and, but with a hybrid security, uh, that risk is greater. We see many cases of uh, hybrid issuers not calling, uh, in which case, in many cases, the, the security becomes a, a perpetual with no fixed maturity date. Okay, so so we can just go to the retail portfolio. It, there's a definition by ASIC. Um, ASIC distinguishes between retail investors and wholesale investors. And there's a definition provided by ASIC which says that to qualify as a wholesale investor, the investor needs to have Two and a half million dollars in net assets, or to have earned a gross income of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in each of the last two years. Um, now, the reason this is important is because some bonds are only available to wholesale investors, uh, which means if you do qualify um, as a wholesale investor, that's a good thing because uh, you have access to a broader universe of opportunities. But if you don't qualify, uh, that doesn't matter because there's a there's a broad universe of bonds also available to those who don't meet that definition, uh, who, who are termed retail investors. Uh, now, FIG doesn't make the rules, but we do need to follow them, so it, it's really worth pointing that out. Now, um, on this page, we're seeing four bonds that uh, are available to, to retail investors, and the average return is 5.88% uh, across them. Now, to put this in context, let's, let's think about just how low interest rates are at the moment. Uh, the official cash rate set by the Reserve Bank is 3%. The three-month bank bill rate is about 3%. Uh, and here, it, you're able to get a very low-risk portfolio of bonds 
um, worth about $200,000 across four different bonds, yielding 5.88%. So that's almost double the return on, that you can get on a wholesale bank bill at the moment, um, or a typical at call bank account. So um, you know, if you're a, a retiree relying on income, uh, the ability to double your income in a, in a low risk way is very appealing. Quickly going through these four bonds, one's issued by Sydney Airport. Uh, it's an inflation linked bond, um, and assuming inflation of two and a half percent through to maturity. The yield of maturity is 6.9 percent. Now, why do we assume a two and a half percent inflation rate? Simply because one of the mandates uh, for the Reserve Bank is to maintain inflation between two and three percent. Now, if inflation is 10 percent, uh, if it averages 10 percent, 10 percent between now and maturity, then the investor is going to get something like 14.5 percent on this bond. So that illustrates the protection you have uh, against inflation. The second bond is uh, issued by Morgan Stanley, uh, a very large quality US bank. It's a senior bond, so it sits towards the top of that pecking order of risk. It's available for a $50,000 face value and it provides a yield of 4.98% to maturity. Uh, so good solid return, uh, good sleep at night factor being a senior bond from a high quality bank. The third bond is issued by Dalrymple Bay Coal Terminal. Now, this is a, another infrastructure business. Um, they, uh, they have take or pay contracts, uh, which provides a very reliable revenue stream for the, uh, for the issuer. It, again, it's a senior bond. It's investment grade quality. Now, investment grade, that's another piece of jargon. Uh, that just means it's, it's the share equivalent to blue chip. But investment grade bond means the risk of the issuer defaulting is very, very low. Okay, uh, close to zero in fact. It's very, it's very low and I think uh, it was, might have been 2001 when we saw the last investment grade bond issuer in Australia def default on an obligation and that was HIH. So here we have uh, another low risk senior bond yielding 6.16%. Uh, and the fourth bond is issued by Vero Insurance. Now Vero is 100% uh, owned by Suncorp Metway Insurance. Uh, Suncorp's a big financial conglomerate. About two thirds of their business is insurance and one third is banking. And Vero is one of the brand names that they trade under. Um, it's actually recently been converted to the name Suncorp. So it's, the issue now is Suncorp. This is a subordinated bond, uh, likely to be called in a couple of years time uh, and yielding 5.46%. So again, um, with a cash rate at 3% and term deposits yielding around 4% and looking very likely to fall, uh, if you can get an average return across a high quality investment grade portfolio around 6%, we suggest that's uh, you know, well worth looking at for the defensive part of your um, portfolio. So that's a retail portfolio. We'll just uh, switch now to a um, Wholesale portfolio. Uh, Silver Chef uh, is a Brisbane-based uh, company performing very well. Their market capitalisation is around $200 million. They issued a bond in September of last year uh, that was exclusively arranged by FIG. The bond was is, uh, yielding, well, it was issued at a, a six-year fixed rate of 8.5%. Since then, interest rates have fallen and demand for the bond has been quite strong. It's now yielding 7.23%, uh, still an excellent return and a great opportunity for um, investors who don't own it yet. Available in denominations of 50,000 face value. The next one is issued by Suncorp Metway. It's another uh, subordinated bond yielding 5.46%. The third one is a hybrid, also known as a tier one security. But this is a, a hybrid that trades in the over-the-counter market, not the ASX listed market. Uh, it's, it's also a debt-like hybrid, um, which means it's highly likely to be called in May 2017. Uh, and um, if it's not called, then Swiss Re has to pay a high rate of interest. The rate of interest crack goes up by 1%, uh, providing further incentive for them to redeem the security in May 2017. 
Swiss Re is the world's second largest reinsurance company. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, that's Warren Buffett's company, made a significant investment in Swiss Re during the GFC. They've since been repaid in full. Uh, Warren Buffett knows his insurance companies and uh, obviously likes Swiss Re. Uh, we've liked Swiss Re for a long time also and it's performed very well for our investors. But still offering an excellent return of 6.81%. And I'd encourage people to compare that to the, the types of return available on um, some of the major bank listed hybrid deals, uh, which have an inferior rating, uh, are structurally riskier, uh, longer dated, and also providing a lower rate of return. So when you're looking at relative value, uh, this is excellent relative value, Swiss Re. Uh, the fourth bond is issued by NAB. Uh, the actual issuer name is National Capital Instruments, but NAB sits behind it. Uh, like Swiss Re, it's a, it's a tier one security or, or an over-the-counter hybrid. Uh, it is callable in September 2016. So for all intents and purposes, um, investors are likely to get their money back in, in uh, three and a half years' time, and it's yielding 6.1%. Uh, this is another example of a over-the-counter security, uh, which is less risky um, than the new breed of bank hybrids, uh, yet providing a higher rate of return and, and with a shorter tenor. Now, if you average the returns of those, uh, those four securities, you get an average return of 6.49%. Now, if I told you we could give you a bond portfolio two years ago yielding 6.5%, um, you wouldn't be very excited. But right now, with interest rates at 3% and turn deposits at 4% and falling, uh, it, it looks very attractive. I'll just go back quickly to term deposits and, and why I, I say they're likely to fall. Firstly, the market um, has actually factored in the likelihood of half a percent in rate cuts. Um, so what that means is the, um, the market consensus is that the official cash rate will move from 3% to 2.5% sometime this year. But furthermore, the banks have all been very hungry for term deposit funding uh, as the best kind of funding source since the GFC. Uh, and they've been paying very aggressive margins and very high interest rates to attract those term deposits. They've pretty much got their fill of term deposits now, and now they're starting to, to contract those margins and pay lower interest rates. Now, before the GFC, um, banks were generally paying about half a percent under the cash rate uh, to raise term deposits. Now they're paying about 1% over. Now if we go back to the cash rate, you know, we, we can see the term deposit rates heading towards 3%. So um, with bonds, you actually have the opportunity to lock in a return of 6% or more uh, over, a, over a longer period of time, uh, as opposed to term deposits where you've got that reinvestment risk of rolling them over uh, at lower rates uh, as they mature. This page here just demonstrates uh, a wider universe of bonds, and this is again, this is just a small subset of the universe, but um, it gives you a flavour for the types of issuers. So we have the Commonwealth government at the top. Um, now that's just yielding 2.83% for a relatively short um, Commonwealth government bond. There's a bond here issued by Queensland Treasury Corp, so that's guaranteed by the Queensland government. Um, yielding 3.38%. Now that's a short bond too, because there's a there's a, a longer dated bond issued by uh, the Queens, Queensland Treasury Corp, yielding around 5%. And that's that's a bond I like very much, not just for the return and the low risk and the liquidity, but the fact that it can um, provide a very suitable portfolio hedge, in the sense that if equities collapse, uh, you expect interest rates to fall and government bond prices to rise. And a long-dated, high-quality bond, fixed-rate bond like this, this long one issued by QTC yielding around 5% um, provides a nice buffer to any portfolio with risk in it. Uh, certainly very nice to have something going up in price that's liquid when everything else is going down in price. Uh, moving down the list, we have Wes Farmers, a name everyone's familiar with, Socgen, um, a large French bank, another large French bank, BNP Paribas. These are all senior bonds. Telstra needs no introduction. Westpac, Brisbane Airport Group, uh, Morgan Stanley, Leighton Finance, all senior bonds. Stockland, senior bond. Uh, Vero and Suncorp, a subordinated bond. We've got Mervac, NAB, Darimple Bay Coal Terminal, 
Uh, Preco, Preco is not a household name, but it's a, it's a public-private partnership providing a key piece of infrastructure, uh, which is the, the Australian Defence Headquarters in Canberra. Uh, and their customers, the Australian Government, 100% of their revenue comes from the Australian Government, uh, and this is a senior bond uh, set to repay investors in 2020, um, yielding around 6.3%. Uh, Rabobank, um, very strong uh, Dutch bank, uh, you know, issuing a, a tier one hybrid, also yielding 6.35%. Swiss Re, similar structure I've already mentioned, yielding even more. Uh, the Sydney Airport inflation linked bond, they've actually got one maturing in 2020 and another in 2030. Uh, but you know, assuming uh, benign inflation around 2.5%, then you're getting a yield close to 7% there. And there's also a a tier one hybrid security issued by AXA, the French insurance giant, uh, yielding close to 8%. So that, that gives you a sense for the, the types of returns available and the types of issuers um, borrowing in, in the Australian bond market. Now, um, importantly, uh, how, how do you access these opportunities? Well, it's very simple. Uh, you fill out a form. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, you just fill out one form uh, providing key information uh, like the name of your investment entity. It might be your self-managed super fund or a family trust or it could be in your own name uh, or company name, whatever it is. Uh, and to own bonds, you, you need a custodian. Um, so just like your shares are held um, by Chess and, and you get monthly holding statements, um, your bonds are held by a custodian uh, in safe custody. And to do that, you need to open a custody account. FIG is a licensed custodian, licensed by ASIC, uh, and, and that, costs, that, that service costs nothing. So you, you open up the custody account, uh, and then you, you have a relationship with a, a fixed income specialist at FIG. So they will uh, be interested in what your risk parameters are, your, um, your investment criteria, uh, any preferences you may have, and they'll tailor a portfolio of bonds to suit. Now certainly FIG has its favourites um, based on us scouring the market for relative value um, and risk return properties, uh, and uh, you know, we will we'll present, subject to your own preferences, we'll present bonds that we think best match those, that, that criteria and offer the best relative value and they're going to perform best for you. Now the bonds are available uh, from $50,000 face value and up, so um, now available to a much broader range of investors. Uh, now in, in terms of how, how does FIG get paid, um, FIG's a broker and there's two, I guess um, the two main parts of FIG's business that I alluded to earlier, there's the term deposit service that we offer, uh, where we, you get a choice of term deposits and the, the best range, the best rates from a range of providers. Um, in that case, the bank pays FIG a margin for raising term deposit funding for it, and that margin works out to be less than 10 basis points per annum, so um, it, it, it reflects the, the very high volume and low margin business that FIG's in. The other side of our business, bonds, um, bonds trade on what's known as a bid offer spread. Um, so to highlight how that works, if FIG can buy a bond issued by Telstra at 6.4%, we can offer that bond to our clients at 6.3%, uh, and and the margin and ma the margin represents revenue to FIG. So if we offer you a bond at 6.3%, that's exactly what you get uh, on a hold to maturity basis. There's no other fees uh, for research, for custody, or for owning that bond. Um, through its life. You also get access, as a client of FIGS, you get access to independent fixed income research. Now independence is really important. FIGS not aligned with uh, any, um, any other entity. Uh, we're, we're, very in, we're completely independent and, uh, and our research reflects our, our true views of what, what, what offers value and um, the safest places to invest. Uh, and FIG also provides help with bond selection and portfolio construction. Um, so once we've had a conversation, we will, we'll email your portfolio. Um, it, it might include fixed, floating and inflation-linked bonds, or it might be skewed towards one or the other, uh, or 
higher rated bonds or higher yielding bonds, whatever your preferences are. Um, we'll discuss that and then once you decide what you want to do, you pay the money through to the um, FIG trust account uh, and, and the bonds are moved into your custody account. At all times our clients have full control over their holdings. The bonds are owned directly by you and you have full control over them. So, um, because bonds are relatively new to a lot of investors in the Australian market, FIG provides a lot of education um, and a lot of tools to assist you in the process of, of understanding what you're investing in. Uh, we've written a book, The Australian Guide to Fixed Income, and we're about to release a second edition of that. Uh, it's a comprehensive guidebook to the Australian fixed income market. Uh, it debunks a lot of the jargon, uh, and there's, there's a glossary in there, and um, we, we've written it, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, as simply as we can to, to convey the key messages. Uh, already over 8,000 copies have been just distributed of this book. We also offer a professional online fixed income course uh, that's certified by the FPA, uh, which planners can receive CPD points for. Uh, we publish a weekly newsletter via email, it's called The Wire, it provides research, analysis and, and commentary on developments in the local and international fixed income markets. Uh, that's, a, that's a quality pub publication, I'd, I'd recommend it to you. Uh, we also publish these uh, Fig Essentials guides, which is a, just very light reading, just a few pages uh, summarising the basics um, on a whole range of topics. Fixed income generally, um, residential mortgage-backed securities being a type of bond uh, which is um, in favour with many of our clients, uh, and also inflation-linked bonds. We're, we're seeing a huge demand at the moment for people seeking inflation protection from uh, uh, inflation indexed annuities and capital index bonds. Okay, um, well, at, at this point um, that concludes the presentation but uh, I'd, I'd welcome some questions. Uh, hi Dave, uh, while we're waiting I'll cover some questions that we've uh, had received on the way through. Um, one question from Pauline was, uh, is there a large variety of types of bonds in the ILB sphere? I'll just add there that uh, there's also inflation-linked bonds from, from some of the large banks and uh, also from the governments, uh, and they're generally issued by uh, institutions and, and companies that have long-term investment horizons. Uh, there's another question. Just you mentioned the... Sorry, Gav, just before we move on... Uh, you've, you've... Yes. Sorry, Gav, just before we move on, I think it's worth mentioning that a lot of the inflation-linked bonds have long maturity days. Uh, and um, but and a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, aren't entirely comfortable with that when they first hear about it. But it's worth pointing out that bonds are the only or fixed income is the only asset class that has a maturity date. So if you own shares, they don't have a maturity date. Um, bonds with maturity dates in even say 20 years time um, are going to be inherently more capital stable than than shares with no maturity date. Um, 
And we just go back to the point that you can sell the bond prior to maturity. And very few bonds are actually held to maturity. They're, uh, they're sold uh, at, at an appropriate time. Um, so capital index bonds and inflation indexed annuities, um, they're quite long, but they, they offer some really good value and long-term inflation protection. And the reason they're issued long-term is because in institutions demand those, those longer time frames to protect themselves from inflation. Uh, John has a question. Uh, you discussed uh, the 500k parcels and, and how they have uh, liquidity. What about liquidity in the 50k parcels? So yeah, very very similar liquidity. Um, we we're trading in uh, in 50 and 100 thousand dollar parcels uh, all day every day and. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, uh, very rarely would we have any issue um, you know, assisting investors sell those into the market uh, at the market price. So uh, uh, yeah, FIG's there to facilitate that and, um, and, and these bonds, because they're, they're so actively traded, uh, very rarely would we have trouble getting a, what's known as a bid to, to buy those bonds off you. Uh, got a question: Can I become? Can clients who are non-residents become? Uh, can people who are non-residents become clients? Sorry. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, look, non-residents can become clients. Um, yep, yeah, most certainly. Uh, Pauline's asked. Do we offer advice on buying and selling bonds? Well, Fig is a um, Fig's license to provide general product advice, um, and what that means is that we can tell you everything you want to know about um, the fixed income assets that we're dealing. Uh, so the whole gamut of interest-bearing securities. But what we're not licensed to do is to give personal advice. So what that what that means is that uh, we we won't uh, you know ask you about your your personal circumstances and 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 tell you how much you should be allocating to different asset classes and um, and you know but what we will do is if if you come to us and say well I've got a million dollars in my self managed super fund uh, I think it's prudent to allocate uh, fifty percent of that to bonds um, and I want to keep my money safe and I want to know the 10 bonds that FIG deems the best relative value, then yeah, most certainly we'll, we'll tell you uh, what we think is the best value and, and most suitable for your circumstances. Uh, Anne has a question, are bonds held to maturity with less at maturity? Yeah, okay, well it all depends when you buy them. So. Here we need to distinguish between nominal bonds and inflation linked bonds. Now a nominal bond is issued um, at $100 and repays $100 of maturity. So uh, it's like a term deposit, you, you invest $100, you get $100 back in maturity. Um, an inflation linked bond is different. Uh, the capital index bond, as I mentioned, because the, the capital value is increasing in line with CPI, um, if you invest $100 on, the, on, on issue, you can expect to receive a much higher value back at maturity. Um, whereas with an inflation indexed annuity bond, because the principal is actually being repaid to you each quarter over the life of the bond, then at maturity um, it's fully paid out, both principal and interest. So uh, essentially with any bond, what, what you're buying is a stream of cash flows. Um, and, and those cash flows are determined when the bond is issued, be it at a fixed rate, um, a fixed margin over a floating rate, or a fixed real yield over CPI. Uh, we have a question, uh, do we handle bonds in other currencies, UK pounds, US dollars, etc.? Yes we do, so uh, we, we have relationships all over the world with uh, various counterparties, uh, banks, funds and, and other brokers like ourselves in places like London and Europe and the US and so we pride ourselves on uh, providing the broadest access to markets to our clients. Um, most of our business is in Aussie dollar bonds 
uh, but we do a lot of business in other currencies, including US dollars, uh, sterling, and euro. They'd probably be the main currencies we trade in, but there's there's uh, there's no reason why we can't trade in other currencies as well. Uh, worth, worth noting though that um, a lot of those non-Aussie dollar bonds offer some really good value at the moment. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, local fund managers are showing a preference for issuers that are well known to them and their boards. So for example, the four major banks, their bonds trade cheap in Europe because the European banks are preferring names like um, RBS, but European names like Swiss Re and Axe and Rabobank are trading cheap in Australia. So that's an anomaly which I think our investors can take advantage of. Uh, be, be that in uh, investing in a foreign currency or be that investing in Aussie dollars. I just want to go back to the previous question. I'm not sure I answered it as well as I could have because I distinguish between uh, nominal bonds and inflation linked bonds, but uh, most bonds are actually not bought on issue. They're bought in this, what's known as the secondary market. So if a bond's issued for $100, on day one, when it's trading, it's trading what's known as the secondary market and the price will be will deviate somewhat from that issue price. So the return that you effectively lock in when you buy the bond um, is dictated by the price you pay for it and how much you're going to get back in maturity. And one of the beauties of the bond market is the mathematical certainty over the returns you get as long as the issuer survives and meets obligations as expected. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. Uh, that will, at that point, we'll uh, call an end to today's presentation. Uh, for those of you, if I didn't get to your answer to your question uh, through the uh, presentation, we will get back to you after the uh, after we go offline, and we'll and we'll respond to all questions.